Hello. Welcome to the Underfloor Air Distribution chapter of this DVD. My intent is to provide you with the information you need to understand this innovative air delivery system. In this chapter, we'll cover the circumstances that prompted Underfloor Air Distribution developments, how it works, some of the benefits it offers, some design and construction guidelines that make for successful projects, and we'll share some of the lessons we've learned through the years of experience working with Underfloor Air. Underfloor air delivery is a byproduct of the development of raised access floors. In the beginning, they were used primarily for data centers, computer rooms, and similar facilities. Human comfort was not a primary concern. As technology became an increasingly integral part of business, and the need to gain access to building infrastructure, such as electrical, phone, and data lines throughout the business environment grew, raised access floors allowed unfettered pathways to route and reroute cable. All raised access floors have removable panels supported by grids of pedestals of various heights. This grid and panel design allows easy access to the space in systems below, greatly simplifying reconfiguration of the space above. It wasn't long before construction professionals realized that the space below the raised floor could act as a duct. Technology and creativity met an opportunity to address the demands of contemporary business environments. I guess what I like the most about the underfloor system is its flexibility. Uh, it's flexible, it is efficient, um, and its distribution is tremendous. To understand underfloor error, we found this very useful to compare it to traditional ducted mixing systems, something with which we are all very familiar. Overhead ducted systems are generally mixing systems with a lot of sheet metal and the labor to fabricate and install it. Occupying about 24 to 36 inches below the structure, they usually deliver 55 degree air at relatively high velocities through diffusers mounted high in the space. These systems push large amounts of conditioned air into the existing occupied airspace that is being heated by people, electronics, lights, exterior walls, etc. The job of a mixing system is to dilute that heat back into the space with enough cooler air to maintain the desired space temperature. The space air also contains contaminants, such as volatile organic compounds, or VOCs, from carpet, paint, adhesives, CO2, and skin cells from people, dust, dirt, pollen, and so on. The air provided for cooling is also filtered and provided with outdoor air so that the mixing of the overhead air into the existing warmer, contaminated air in the entire space allows the system to maintain the desired room temperature and a tolerable level of contaminants. Underfloor air distribution uses a space beneath the raised access floor, usually 14 to 18 inches, as a pressurized plenum, which contains 60 to 65 degree air. This plenum essentially acts as a duct throughout the entire floor plate. The plenum is pressurized to approximately 0.05 inches of static pressure and is delivered at lower velocities through floor mounted diffusers. This smoke test shows conditioned air delivered low in the space. Underfloor air delivers the air in the first six to seven feet of the space above the floor, which we refer to as the occupied zone. Above this point, the warmer air will rise out of the occupied zone into the unoccupied zone where the heat and contaminants are allowed to stratify. There is still some mixing in underfloor air systems in the first four or five feet above the floor, but not as much as overhead systems. Most of the warmed air and contaminants stratify high in the space, carried there by plumes of heat from all heat generating sources in the space. Underfloor air distribution puts the conditioned air in the occupied space in the first six or seven feet where it is needed, where the people are. If you think about the way heat rises off the pavement, or heat waves, that's an easy mental depiction of what happens with heat sources in a room. Heat will rise from the source, and if left undisturbed, it will rise out of the occupied space, stratifying near the ceiling. These graphics illustrate a typical temperature profile of an underfloor air distribution system and a ducted overhead system. The redder the color, the hotter the temperature. The mixing system is doing what it was designed to do constantly mixing up the heat and contaminants in the space. 
The underflow air system is allowing heat to stratify in the unoccupied zone, shown as a redder color toward the ceiling. You can see the heat plumes are more pronounced on the underfloor side of the profile and that the conditioned air is more concentrated where the people are in the space. Engineers may be wondering, with 60 to 65 degree air, what about humidity? And wouldn't you need twice as much air? We'll save the latter for our discussion about loads. But here's how we handle humidity. Air is brought in through the return of the unit, mixed with outdoor air and then cooled to around 55 degrees, removing the moisture from the air. The air is then mixed with return air from a bypass damper and then reheated additionally by the fan. We modulate the bypass air based on the relative humidity in the space. You would be very surprised to know that only 10 to 15 percent of the total CFM supplied is bypassed return air for bringing the supply air temperature up to 60 or 65 degrees at peak load. The load in the space is the same for an underflow air system as it is for an overhead mixing system. The difference is in how we handle the load because we are only cooling the occupied zone and allowing the heat plumes to stratify out of the occupied zone the amount of CFM is less or nearly the same as with an overhead mixing system. As you can see, the amount of load conditioned by an underfloor air distribution system is approximately 40% less than the overhead system. This is because we are not diluting the load back into the space, but allowing it to leave the occupied zone through its natural buoyancy to do so. Using the equation to determine CFM needed for cooling, in this case, yields us with nearly the same amount of error for either system. In some cases, this displaced load will be taken back to the cooling coil and will have to be allocated to the cooling plant. Otherwise, it can be exhausted from the building for further savings. In spaces with larger volumes, you may be able to allow the heat to collect in the unoccupied space and dissipate over time. It is important to point out that every space will have to be evaluated and the load calculated. As with overhead mixing, there are no rules of thumb or cookbook approaches that are safe to assume. the culture of poor indoor air quality just went away. I and mean, we went from having calls and complaints on a weekly basis from people that were feeling ill, you know, would get headaches, you know, all those classic symptoms of poor indoor air quality, uh, to a building where we really didn't get phone calls and we really haven't had a problem since. Here we have a similar graphic showing carbon dioxide profiles. As with heat, contaminants in the ducted overhead system are thoroughly mixed, keeping contaminants within the space for long periods of time. This makes the quality of the space and the return air virtually the same. With underfloor air supply, contaminants are allowed to stratify into the unoccupied zone. This stratification moves much of the CO2 and other contaminants from the occupied space into the unoccupied space and helps improve indoor air quality. The air from the unoccupied zone, which is of a higher concentration of contaminants than the occupied space, is returned to the supply air unit where air is purged and replaced with outdoor air and cleaned through filtration. Ducted overhead mixing systems, diffusers, and return grills are generally located high in the space, which may to some extent short circuit some of the conditioned air back into the return, reducing the cooling and mixing effect. With underfloor air, it delivers all the air low in the space and returns it all high. As we said before, the air enters the space and is mixed in about the first four to seven feet of the space, allowing most of the heat and contaminants to stratify into the unoccupied zone where return air is drawn from. Now we have a pretty good understanding of underfloor air distribution and how it compares with traditional ducted mixing systems. Next we'd like to point out what we see as some of the benefits derived from underfloor air. 